When I entered Wall Street back in 2004, I thought I was adequately prepared to deal with wealthy people and their sizable assets. 2008, the great recession, the great crash of the stock market, I quickly realized that studying security analysis, economics, money, banking, stocks, bonds, had not prepared me for what I was seeing. What I was seeing was highly intelligent, otherwise rational investors calling me up and asking me to do the most insane things, such as completely liquidate their stock portfolio. And the reasons and the rationales for doing so were puzzling. These were CFOs of public companies. These are people who put together plans, well thought out plans, as far as growing their wealth into the future. And I realized I was seeing something that I was not exposed to in all my years of studying finance. And then when I looked further, I realized that my clients were not the only ones. Pretty much across the board, you will find these idiosyncrasies of investors, these biases, these irrationalities play themselves out during times of stress and turmoil. So I realized that I have to go back to school and I have to relearn what it means to be a wealth advisor. And I came across a field of study called behavioral finance, which is absolutely fascinating. And the moment I was exposed to it, I was literally hooked. It started with a book by Dan Ariely called Predictably Irrational. I then went on to read books by people like Daniel Kahneman, Mark Belsky, and many, many others. And what I realized is that when we watch the market, we watch investors, when we watch ourselves making decisions that have to do with finance, and as we're going to see tonight, far beyond finance, we actually think that we're making rational decisions. But in many instances, we're not. Either we're making emotional decisions, or we're making what we think is a rational decision based on very faulty data. So each of you filled out a questionnaire before you walked in here. There were two teams, green and yellow. You pretty much got the same questions. Some of them are identical. Some of them had small nuanced differences, which we're going to show you now. And this was there to see whether or not you fit the profile of a typical human being. And if you do, you will probably fit the profile of a typical investor or even decision maker. I just put out eight questions over here, but the truth of the matter is I could have put out 60, 70, 80 questions. But some of these, I think, will be relevant to our discussion tonight. So my questions are, why is it that some people sell their stocks right before the prices skyrocket? Why do some people hold on to stocks for way too long as they watch the share prices plummet? Why have I met hundreds of people who keep balances on HELOCs, other high interest bearing loans such as credit cards and so on, racking up thousands of dollars of finance charges while keeping a savings account or a rainy day fund as many counselors tell you to keep, earning close to nothing. Why do most investors, and this is statistically tracked, sit out big market rallies? And why do the typical investors jump in sort of at the top only to ride the market down again? Why do we spend so much on credit cards? We've done this with the work I've done with Masila, with Living Smarter Jewish, and so on. You want to bring a family's budget into line, the first thing you do is you cut up their credit cards. You force them to spend cash and checks. Why do we spend more on credit cards than we would do if we took our wallet out and spent cash? Why am I hearing so many people fetching over the price of eggs when they went up to $3.99 a dozen, yet those same people will go out to a restaurant and spend $95 or more on a steak and not think twice about it? Why do we think we get bargains when we buy things that are marked down? Why do sales attract us and why do companies have such an easy time 
luring us to buy certain products. If you study the psychology of marketing, you'll see how retailers use marketing strategies to get you to buy exactly what they want you to buy, and we, as humans, fall for it. And a timely question, why is affinity fraud, despite all the warnings that we've seen over the years, still so prevalent amongst us and in the world in general? As I write many times in my book, success comes down to how you think, or whether you think. You guys filled out a questionnaire, and all of you believed that you were thinking. As I'm going to share the results, you're going to realize you may have an aha moment that you actually weren't thinking at all. You may have been using your gut, you may, have been gotten, you may have gotten a hunch, but even in some of the instances where applied thought would have given you the answer, many of you didn't get the answer. And that's not because you live in Lakewood, because you don't have a Harvard degree. If I gave this questionnaire to thousands of people who went to Harvard, I would get very similar results, perhaps somewhat different, because they've been trained, perhaps, to pick up some of the traps that I put into these questionnaires. So let's start with a word which I learned from Danny Kahneman, a Nobel Prize laureate, who really pioneered this idea of behavioral finance. And the word is a heuristic. A heuristic is a mind trap that we use to come up with an answer that we believe is adequate. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it leads to serious errors. Sometimes it's actually an efficient, time-saving mechanism. We don't think about the statistics of certain things that bring danger to us. If we hear the word danger, we go into protection mode. Sometimes using a heuristic is simple intellectual laziness. Instead of doing the work and trying to understand what's really going on, we just use a rule of thumb or we go with our gut feeling. And this, as we're going to see, can lead to serious financial mistakes. Okay. So I asked you all a question. The bat and a ball cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? 90% of you answered either 10 cents or 25 cents. The obvious answer is 10 cents for many people, but it's actually absolutely positively wrong. Now, think about it. If the ball costs 10 cents and the bat costs a dollar more, the bat has to cost a dollar 10, which would make the total a dollar 20, and I told you the total is a dollar 10. So, 10% of you got it right. You wrote five cents, which is the right answer. Clap if you got it right. The second question was not as tricky. It didn't require math. The question was, all roses are flowers. Some flowers fade quickly, therefore some roses fade quickly. And the answer is absolutely false. It may very well be that carnations fade quickly, but roses don't. Just because a rose is a flower does not mean that it falls into the category of things that fade quickly. Here, only 60% of you answered true, and 40% of you got it right. So, what we've learned is that you can take perfectly capable adults and give them simple arithmetic questions or simple logic questions, and more than 50% will get it wrong. And that should teach you something about yourself if you answered both of these wrong. By the way, the 40% that got the second one right were almost always the ones who got the first one right. So that some of them, right, some of those guys who got it wrong on the first one got it right on the second one, but almost everybody who got it right on the first one also got it right on the second one. So if you got it right on both of them, it tells you that you may not be as intellectually lazy as 
the average person, which is good. Okay? Now, I'm going to share with you some heuristics, some biases that are prevalent amongst decision makers slash investors. There are many. In 2008, when I studied this, I created a curriculum for NYU, the School of Continuing Education, and I believe at the time I taught 18 different biases and heuristics that investors are subject to. I picked a handful tonight, the ones that I think are the most damaging, but there are plenty more that are equally or slightly less damaging. The first one is what Danny Kahneman calls Wissiati. I think I'm pronouncing it right. What it stands for is what you see is all there is. This is a very famous graphic which you can find on the internet. And it's basically three people walking in a tunnel. And if you're human and normal, the one all the way to the right is larger than the one all the way to the left. Can everybody see that? Anybody disagree? A handful of you disagree, about four or five. The answer is they're exactly the same. And just where the lines are drawn and the way this graphic is shown, your eyes are playing tricks on you. And you think that the one to the right is larger. But mark my words, the first time I did this, I didn't believe my eyes. I didn't believe that it was actually the true, so I cut it out like a two-year-old, and I placed one on top of the other to prove it. So they are exactly the same. Your eyes will play tricks on you. We've learned that your mind will play tricks on you. One of those tricks is you believe that what you see is all there is. So I asked you to meet my friend Steve. And I told you a little bit about him. I told you that he was neat and tidy. I told you that he paid close attention to detail. And I described him to you. And in doing so, I biased you. I biased you into believing exactly what 80% of you believe, that Steve is a librarian, or is more likely to be a librarian. 20% of you got this one right. Why? Who says there's a right answer? Because the question was, which one is he more likely to have as a profession? We don't know Steve. We don't know what he does for a living. All I did was tell you about his personality. So if you pictured him, he represented a librarian. Correct? That's why 80% of you said that. What were you missing in order to make an educated decision, which I would gather 20% of you realized on your own? You were missing what's called the base rate fact, which is, before I biased you, if I told you Steve was a human being who walks planet Earth, and I asked you what profession was he more likely to have, probably all of you would have answered salesman. Because as it turns out, there are only 138,000 librarians in the entire United States, and there are 13 million salespeople. In other words, out of a population of salespeople and librarians, there's almost a 99% chance that if you throw a rock into the crowd, you're going to hit a salesman versus a librarian. Now, have you, has your opinion changed? In other words, has the representation of Steve's personality given you such overwhelming data that you now believe he's still a librarian? And I've always had somebody stand up and say, no, 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 I still believe he's a librarian even though there's a 99% chance that he's not. The reality is there are many more people that look and represent Steve that are salespeople 
Then there are librarians, and I can assure you not all librarians represent somebody that looks like Steve. I'm sure many of them can be very good salespeople. So once you introduce a base rate fact, if I gave you that base rate fact, I didn't have the time to do this, but when I've done this in prior sessions, I've given some of you that base rate fact before I've had you meet Steve, and almost all of you would have answered salesman. But what have you learned? You've learned that when you go into a decision, you are going to make a decision based on, or at least 80% of you, based on what your eyes see, what's before you, what this thing represents. This is one of my favorite studies. They put out racks of suits and dresses. And they did this in two different stores. Identical clothing. A one, the item was marked down from $12.99 and ended at $4.99. In the other, the item was marked up from $1.99 and ended at $4.99. And they wanted to see how many will be bought in store A versus store B. As you could imagine, the ones in store A flew off the shelf, and the ones in store B didn't budge. Nobody buys something that's marked up. Correct? I'm not going to get ripped off on this suit, but all the people that walked out of A said, I got a bargain. My wife comes home from Woodbury Common with one of her bargains, and she shows me that first label. I always remind her that it was not worth $12.99 because if it was, it wouldn't be in Woodbury Common to begin with. It would have sold at $12.99. It wasn't worth $9.99 either. And that is just a trick that this represents to you a bargain. The same suit will sell if they can present it to you as a bargain and it won't sell if they don't. Because the reality is you have absolutely no idea what a suit is worth. I mean, it's worth the, th the cloth and perhaps the cost to sew it in Sri Lanka and to ship it here with some markup at the buttons, probably less than 30 bucks. So we don't know what a suit is worth. So what do we do? We look for some representation to tell us whether or not it's a good buy or not. And the same suit for $4.99 can be perceived as a bargain to one person and a rip-off to another simply by how it was presented. Who cares about any of this? Well, let me give you some examples. Investors make decisions on a buy or a sell based on what? Based on fact? based on knowledge, or based on 52-week highs, what the first or second column that you read, whether it's Barron's or Forbes, what are you looking for? You're looking for something to tell you whether you should or shouldn't buy or sell. IPOs are a perfect example. People line up to purchase them. There's something exclusive that only wealthy people can buy. And everybody believes that they represent a great investment because only certain people can get them. Well, if you look at the data on IPOs and how they actually do, if you actually go beneath the surface and study the base rate facts, you will find it isn't true at all. Most people believe that the market does better under Republican leadership when the data is overwhelmingly the other way. And you speak to people and they say, of course, wealthy people vote for Republicans because they're good for the stock market. Really? Google it. But this is what we believe because that's what this idea represents in our mind. People buy things that they deem safe. Safe based on what? They look safe. They seem safe. Do they really know? Do they have any real facts? 
Why is affinity fraud prevalent? It's called representation bias. The guy seems like an honest person. I know his uncle. I know his neighbors. I spoke to some people about him. Do we really know? Do we truly do our homework? Do we understand the strategy? Do we understand whether or not it's possible for him to be doing what he's doing? There were many clients of mine over the years who brought me different strategies from people that had great, repu re great reputations. We've had many Ponzi schemes which were uncovered by people who looked deeper to try to uncover true facts. The base rate fact is, and I looked at something today which made my stomach turn, it was represented literally as risk-free with 12% returns. The base rate fact is, is that the 10-year treasury is what we would call the risk-free rate. That's the benchmark, if you will. If the 10-year treasury is at 3.8 and somebody's bringing you something that's 12, and the word low risk, risk-free is associated with it, well, if you don't know the base rate fact of what actually risk-free rate looks like, you can believe that there's something out there that's low risk at 12%. Maybe there is. Maybe Steve is a librarian. But 99% of the time, it's not. 99% of the time, when what you see before you deviates that greatly from the base rate fact, it's probably not going to work out as advertised. I know this has nothing to do with finance, but what you see is all there is or a representation bias is the root of so much bias, racism, stereotyping, because instead of doing the work and trying to understand the person standing before us, we will lump them into a category through mental laziness and bias and say, people that look like that, dress like that, have that skin color, really doesn't matter, are blank. Do we know? Of course not. Stop and think how many decisions you make based on what the information readily available represents to you versus digging deeper and getting real information and fact. We'll be right back to this week's episode of Kosher Money. But first, a message from our friends at Twillery. I'm wearing their amazing polo shirt. I have them in all different colors. If you are in the market for new shirts, new pants, a suit, a sports jacket, socks, if I had to describe them in one word, it would be comfortable and professional. But like hyphenate those words because I'm only allowed one word. It's super comfortable and they look professional. Last week, I showed you their jacket, which has that stretch material and the polo shirts have them as well. Super, super comfortable. I'm actually losing weight, so maybe I'll downgrade a size. But if you are in the market for polo shirts, they have these white shirts as well, uh, button down, which I really like. You can get a short sleeve button down shirt, button down all the way, or you can get as a polo. The material there is something like I've never felt before. But don't take my word for it. Take your own word for it. Use promo code CHAI, C H A I on twillery.com slash kosher money. It will give you $18 off your first purchase. We're going to put a link in the show notes. Highly recommend it. If you're not in the market for new shirts, don't buy them. But when you are in the market for new shirts, buy Twillery. And now back to this week's episode. The second one is the idea that not all money is created equal. So I asked yellow and green two sets of questions. Questions are logically similar, but factually different. I asked you to imagine that you bought a $150 ticket to a play, and as you were leaving the house, you realized that you lost your ticket. Will you go and spend another $150 to buy that ticket? I asked Green, 
Similar question. You're on your way to a play that's going to cost $150. You haven't bought the ticket yes, yet. And you realize that somewhere along the way you lost $150 from your wallet. And you still have $150 left to buy the ticket. Would you buy the ticket? So, I asked this question to Ellie. Can I tell them? Ellie said, I gave Ellie the green question and the yellow question. And Ellie said, absolutely, I would buy the ticket in the first one. And he said, absolutely not. I'm sorry. In the yellow ones, he said, absolutely not. And in the green one, he said, absolutely, yes. 90% of you who got the green said, yes, you would spend the $150 from your wallet. And only 40% of you on the yellow team said you would spend the $150 to buy a second ticket. And the reason is, <clears throat> is that the thought to the yellow team to purchase a second ticket or for this play to cost you $300 was something you abhorred, or at least 60% of you did. Whereas 90% of you who got question green said, what does the $150 falling out of my pocket has anything to do, have anything to do with seeing the play. You did not associate them one with the other. And therefore, you probably are wondering, why am I even asking the question? 10% of you said no, because you were probably mindful of the fact that you just lost $150 and you're going to save that ticket so you'll be net even. But 90% of you said, why not? Now, if all money is created equal, at the end of the night, you are $300 poorer if you see that play. Whether or not it was two tickets to the play, or it was $150 from your wallet and $150 for a ticket, you are in exactly the same place. Do you understand that? That's clear, right? Buying a ticket twice, losing $150 on the way to the show and buying a ticket for $150, still, when you open your wallet at the end of the night, puts you in the exact same place. Now, this study has been done thousands and thousands of times, and the vast majority of people answered the way you answered. I then asked another biasing question. Question was, you go to a store to buy a lamp, or you go to a store to buy a dining room set. In the first instance for yellow, it was a $100 lamp, and it was on sale for $75 a few blocks away, and in the green case, it was a $1,775 lamp, and you can get it for $1,750 five blocks away. Those of you who got question yellow, 70% said they would travel the five blocks to save the $25. Lakewood, I'm proud to say, Green did very well. 50% of you said you would still travel five blocks. <laughs> Most oftentimes, it's less than 25%. Now, you can see where I'm going with this, right? Well, some will argue, well, in the yellow case, it's a 25% savings. And in the green case, it's a fraction. Why would I travel five blocks to save one or two percent, right? Or 3%? It's not worth it, right? In the other case, you say, well, 25% is worth it, right? Now, if we would take off our mental accounting hat, all that really matters is, how much is your time worth, and what does gas cost to drive five blocks? Those are the only inputs that really matter. $25 is $25, whether or not it's coming off of a $100 item or a $1,775 item. So why did 70% of you say yes when it was $100? And only 50% of you said yes when it was 1775 
It's because of what we call the mental accounting bias. I was in a car dealership recently, and I was watching this, and it was something to see. It was a Honda dealership, and there was a CRV on the, on the floor. And the people that were looking at it were looking at the features. And they said, is there anything more that we can get in this car if we took a higher trim level? And the guy said, yes, but the higher trim level is going to be probably three to four weeks, and it's going to be $3,000 more. And they went through the different options that were available at that higher trim level. And I watched the husband and the wife saying, we don't need that, we don't need that. And then it came to the thing they thought they needed, which is an automatically closing lift gate in the back, a button, a button. And they said, oh, we absolutely must have that. So I was watching all this, and the salesman gave them a few minutes to think it over, and I just meandered over, and I said, I'm just curious. You realize you're going to be paying $3,000 for a button. And that's an expensive button. And of course, the answer was, if I'm spending $35,000 on a car, what's another $3,000? Does that sound logical? It's $3,000. Does it matter if it's, you're overpaying $3,000 for a bottle of milk or $3,000 for a car? The end of the day, it's still $3,000. And a person that's rational says, it doesn't matter how you apply that $3,000. It's the same money. Mental accounting is fascinating. It really is. Going back to my 2008 story, where I became really fascinated with was, I had clients calling me up hysterical that they want to liquidate their portfolios. The market's crashing, it's going to zero, it's terrible, get me out. And I asked a simple question. Would you like me to sell your IRA stocks? So you have a personal account, you have an IRA. Should I sell it all? Oh, no, 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 leave the IRA alone. The IRA is fine. Why is the IRA different than your personal account? That's long term. But do you realize that the stocks in your personal account are also long term? And the answer is, I don't see it that way. I put a mental accounting label of long term on my 401k and IRA. But even though I've done thoughtful planning and that the stocks in my personal account are truly long term, the answer is, since they're bucketed together with other things that are not so long term, I think of that bucket differently than the IRA. So I actually tried this with a client and it worked. I said, how about if we split your account up between your stocks, your bonds, and your cash? And I retitle them long-term money and short intermediate-term money. Would that work? And he said, well, if you could show me that we can actually um, justify that my stocks are long-term, the answer is yes, and it worked. So I realized that mental accounting, actually this is one of the best, one of the reasons why IRAs are so effective, is that we truly keep that money in a long-term bucket, and we mental account for it, and we leave it alone, whereas all our other accounts, we're constantly trying to maneuver in and out because we don't see it as something that's set aside. People spend recklessly. They are more cost conscious with a dozen eggs than they are with buying a larger item. They go to a restaurant, they buy a suit, they buy something that has a higher ticketed price. And their $50 up or down doesn't really matter to them. But when they go to the store, they'll try to save 25 cents here, 40 cents here, when they've blown all that the night before at a restaurant and then some. Because of mental accounting, this doesn't bother them and this does. You'll also find that people will spend windfalls, money that they see as a windfall. You'll, you're probably not familiar because you're all Lakewood, B'nai Tyra, but I remember 
watching a show years ago called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I don't even know if it's still on because I don't watch TV, but, and you have this person sitting there and they just won $500,000, right? And of course the host says, so do you want to go for a million? And the whole crowd is screaming, yeah, yeah, go, go, go. And the person goes for the million. And sometimes they win, most often times they don't. And then, oh, we're sorry. I always wondered, imagine if at that moment, he stopped the show. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan, we've run out of time. We're gonna have you come back tomorrow. And then you can decide whether or not you wanna go for a million dollars. And in the meantime, Susan, what we're going to do is we're going to wire the $500,000 into your checking account. And tomorrow, when we ask you the question, you're going to either say yes, and if you do, you're going to write out a $500,000 check, and if no, you get to go home. I want you to imagine Susan coming back the next day, sitting there on the seat and saying, okay, Susan, do you want to go for it? And everyone's screaming, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, are you out of your mind? You're asking me, basically, to roll the dice and lose $500,000 that's already in my checking account. The answer is, there's no way she would do it if she's sane. Because at that moment, it's no longer windfall. At that moment, it's her money. Had that not happened, she was playing with funny money. It's not real money. This is what we call the lottery effect. I made money on a stock. I made money on an investment. People tell this to me all the time. I think it's time to sell. Only sell my cost. Leave the winnings in or leave the profits in. I'm willing to play with that. Really? Is it different money than the other money? Or a 24-year-old who comes into my office and says, I've just inherited this money from my great-grandmother. I'd like you to put it into a savings account or a CD for me. I say, but you're 24 years old. I know, but it's grandmother's money. Grandmother's no longer here. But that has been mental accounted as grandmother's money. I've met people. I meet them every day that have $600,000 balances on a HELOC, today, we all know the rates, between 6 and 7 or 8 percent. And at the same time, they have savings accounts, rainy day funds. And I say to them, why don't you take the savings and pay off the HELOC? Oh, no, I need to have savings. But you can write a check from the HELOC if you run short. No, no, I can't sleep at night if there isn't money in my savings account. But you can write a check and it'll go right back in a second later. And do you realize the spread between what you're paying on the HELOC and what you're earning in the bank after tax? And they don't listen. And this makes absolutely no sense. But in their mind, they have savings and they have loans. But they don't see it as one decision. It's also why we spend more on credit cards. It's simple. There's no pain in it. We don't actually account for what we're doing, for what we're truly doing, which is depleting our bank account. We don't actually mentally account for that. We look at it as a swipe. It becomes essentially unpainful. Whereas parting with cash is seen, it's accounted for mentally as a spend. And a spend causes us to think twice because it comes with some emotional pain. A quick break from this week's episode. Our official real estate question of the week for Shmuel Shaiwitz of Approved Funding. Shmuel, you do a lot, especially in the real estate space. Who should be contacting you uh, knowing that people worldwide are listening to Kosher Money? So it couldn't be more true. We are getting calls from people all over, US, abroad. It's amazing. It's incredible, your reach. I would say that the person that should reach out to me should be anybody who's interested in unbiased real estate, finance, credit information, specifically for things in the United States. I also help people who are looking to buy or finance in Israel. But if you just want a friend in finance, if you want a friend in real estate, 
If you want to, if you have a brother or brother-in-law that's in finance and real estate and you want to double check him or her to see if they're telling you the right advice, call me up anonymously. Ask me the question. I will give you the answer. Whether or not we do business together is not my goal. My goal is to help as many people as possible get the right information, learn what they want to learn and accomplish what they want to set out to achieve. Love that. A human walking Rolodex. Approvedfunding.com slash kosher money. You can find Shmuel and his company there. Highly recommend. Join the many hundreds that have reached out already. And now back to this week's episode. Thousands. Whoa, whoa. Don't go back to this week's episode yet. It's thousands, which is phenomenal. Makes sense. I mean, some of our videos have millions of views. Okay. Back to this week's episode now. Okay. The next question. I gave you two scenarios, right? You own 10,000 shares of ABC stock. Who feels greater regret, right? You name them, George and David. Which has been soaring. You decide to sell 5,000 shares. As you check the market the next day, do you hope the stock rises or falls? Well, most of you said falls. I would say falls. In fact, I've spoken to some of my smartest clients, and they all say, I wish the stock falls tomorrow. That makes absolutely no sense. You own 10,000 shares of the company. You decide to sell half. And now you wish the stock falls the next day. But emotionally, doesn't that make sense? You want to be vindicated. You want to feel that you made the right choice. You don't want to feel regret. And if your market keeps going up with that stock, the first reaction you're going to have the next day is, why did I sell? You so abhor regret that you would rather lose money than feel regret. Because since you still own 5,000 shares of this stock, you're actually losing money the next day by the, res by the virtue of it falling, but that's okay. I don't want to feel stupid, I don't want to be regretful, and the next morning the stock drops 7% and you want to give kiddish. You're so excited. I was smart enough to sell 5,000 shares. I'm telling you I've asked this question to some of my most logical clients and we laugh about it because we know how irrational it is. But it just demonstrates how much we hate regret. Now, I asked you to take this point forward. Two questions. One is David and one is George. The difference is David owns shares in company A and he decides or he has to make a decision whether or not to switch his stock for company B. And he decides against it. And after a year he realizes he would have been $1,200 better off had he made that switch. George owns share in company B and he switched to company A. And at the end of the year, he realizes that he would have been $1,200 better off had he made that, not made that switch. At the end of the day, both David and George would have been $1,200 better off had they made a different decision than they made. You follow? They're in the same place. I asked you who feels greater regret, David or George? And you all answered, except for 5% of you, 95% said that George would have greater regret. Why? It's simple. George did something that caused him a $1,200 loss. David did nothing. And when you act and it doesn't work out, it's far more painful than when you don't act and it doesn't work out. Now, do you understand that? It makes sense, right? Now, given that 95% of you agree with that, we have to look at the ramifications. This is what stops many people or investors from taking decisive action. They don't want to regret their action. So going back to the 10,000 shares scenario, you own 10,000 shares of that stock. 
A little voice inside says, this stock has been going up a lot. It's probably time to take profits. And a little voice in your stomach says, yeah, but if you do and it keeps going up, you're going to regret your decision. I will tell you that most successful investors regret their sell decisions over the short term and regret their buy decisions over the short term. Because very few people sell at the top and buy all the way at the bottom. I'm sure even Warren Buffett didn't buy all the stocks in his portfolio at the bottom. He's willing to experience short-term regret for what he knows is going to be long-term gain. But since we've realized through our questions that so many of us are biased by regret, we have to take that into account. When we're going to buy something, part of our decision is going to be, will I regret this? And when I don't sell something when I should, a big part of that's going to be, I don't want to regret my decision, even for the short term. This is why a lot of people stay on the sidelines. Why do so many investors stay on the sidelines as markets are going up? Simple. I don't want to be the sucker that buys in just before the market falls. I don't want to regret that decision. And therefore, I'm going to sit and watch this thing until I reach a point where I can't take it anymore, which is when most retail investors capitulate and go in. And the same is on the way down. People will capitulate because they'll realize that if I don't sell now, I may regret my decision. After people make mistakes and they regret their decisions, they cower in the corner and lick their wounds. They stay out. I still know people who never went back into the market since 2008 or people that sold out during COVID because the regret was so traumatic to them that they never want to experience it again. And therefore, they'll keep their money doing nothing rather than run the risk of ever feeling that way again. Many people hold stocks that are absolute positive losers. And in their mind, they convince themselves that they haven't lost money because they didn't sell. And they're holding on, thinking or praying that one day they can vindicate that decision and be right. And never have to experience the regret of selling and realizing they took a loss. That is absolutely ridiculous. The only decision that an investor should make regarding a buy and sell is what are the prospects of this investment relative to all other investments that I can make with that money? I had this conversation today with a client. I've had it with thousands of clients. He owns a stock. Somebody told him to buy it. It's down 65%. He doesn't want to realize that loss. And I say to him, that loss has value. It's called capital loss. Yeah, but I don't, I don't want to lose this money on this stock. I say, fine, let's hold the stock. Let's hold, let's sell the stock. Let's keep it out of the market for 31 days so we don't violate the wash sale rule, for those of you who know that means. And then we'll buy it back in 31 days. Of course, he's not going to buy it back. Once he gets over the regret of selling it, he'll make a better decision with his money. So many people are sitting with very, very bad investments, hoping it'll get better so they don't have to look themselves in the mirror and say, I made a mistake and regret that initial decision. And in doing so, are costing themselves upside. It's another reason why investors do things in herds. Because when everybody else does it, and you do it, and it doesn't work out, you feel less regretful. I had good reason to do it. Everybody else was doing it. Herd mentality, if you read about it, is another detrimental aspect of investing. Okay, we're getting to our last one. If you are heading to Israel anytime soon, highly recommend you look up the Pantry Packers. This is a division of Kol Chabad, and basically what they allow visitors and tourists to do is partner with Kol Chabad to help package groceries for the people in need in Israel. So if you are there, head over there, to their website at least, pantrypackers.org. It's a division of Kol Chabad. Your entire family can be part of the experience. 
And it really makes a difference. I'm going to be there hopefully in a couple of months, maybe less. And God willing, do plan on going with my family there. Kol Chabad started in 1788. So you know they're doing something right, regardless of gender, ethnic background, degree of religious observance. There, This food that you're packing goes to a family, an individual in need, because nobody in Israel should go hungry. The important thing to remember is if you're not going to be in Israel and you can't help out by actually packing the goods on a volunteer basis, you can actually give charity towards it. So kolchabad.org slash kosher money. Link is in the show notes. The rewards are plenty, right? You're not only gaining a mitzvah, a good deed in this world, but your deeds, your actions, your charity, especially as we come to the Yamim Ra'im, the high holy days, we know tzedakah tatsal mimavis, charity can save people from death. So please give your heart, give of your wallet, open it up, open your heart, open your wallet, and give. kolchabad.org slash kosher money. Support the organization that is literally supporting tens of thousands of people across Israel, from the north to the south, from the east to the west. Kol Chabad is the best. Now back to this week's episode. This is called anchoring. Here we had some fun. I asked the yellow team if the population of Canada was more or less than 20 million. Almost all of you said more. You're right. And then I asked you to estimate the population of Canada. I can't say I tallied up everyone, but I got a vast majority of them. The average was 25 million. Okay? Then I asked those same people what you estimate the tallest redwood is, how tall it is, and if it's more or less than 1,200 feet. Well, a lot of you actually thought it was a lot more. So about 50% of you said more and 50% of you said less. The average came to 2,500 feet. I'm just looking at some representations. I have 3,000 feet, 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet, 1,000 feet, and so on. Now, I asked Green the same question. Basically, what is the question? The question is, what is the population of Canada? And how tall is the tallest redwood? Those are my questions. But I started you off by giving you an anchor. So the yellow team, those of you who got it, saw 20 million for Canada. The green team saw 100 million for Canada. And for the redwood, yellow, I biased them the other way. I gave you 1,200 feet for the tallest redwood. And the green team, I gave you 180. Now, the average for yellow was 25 million for Canada and 2,500 for Redwood. Now look what happened the other way. Green averaged 110 million for Canada. So I asked you if it's more or less than 100 million. Average came to 110 million. So we have 25 million for yellow on the first question, 110 million for green on the first question. And then when we got to the Redwood, we had 2,500 feet for the Redwood for yellow we had 200 feet for green. It's beautiful, isn't it? Again, I can ask this question anywhere around the world to any demographic and the same thing will happen. What I did here was I anchored you. I anchored you to a number which has absolutely nothing to do with the question. You just assumed that if I said 20 million in Canada, it's somewhere around there, right? So you stayed, you were anchored to 20 million and you went to 25 million. And I anchored you to 1,200, and you went to 2,500. Now on the bottom one, I just anchored you to 100, and you went a little bit away from that to 110. And then I anchored you to 180, and you went a little bit away from that to 200. Well, the answer is, the population of Canada is 38 million. So I guess the 25 million people got it closer than the 110. And the tallest redwood is 364 feet. Now stop and realize what I just did to you. Because it's being done to you all around the place. And you are making decisions that you believe are based on fact that have absolutely nothing to do with it. Because again, you don't know the population of Canada because you live in Lakewood. And I bet even if you lived in Canada, you wouldn't know the population of Canada because you probably don't even know the population of the United States. And you have no idea how tall the redwood is. So you're looking, you're grasping for straws. Give me something to go by. And your mind quickly anchored to those numbers. Isn't that fascinating? 
I think it is. You might think, who cares? But let me show you why you should care. I've been on Wall Street a long time. Analyst revisions is a daily occurrence. They're constantly revising their estimates for anything. Company ABC makes 25,000 widgets. Analyst consensus is that next year they're going to create 40,000 widgets. The next year, they create 75,000 widgets. And they're like, oh, so they revise their estimates. And they say, OK, next year, they're going to create 95,000 widgets. The next year, they create 150,000 widgets. They're like, oh, we got that one wrong. What they keep doing, whether it's price, whether it's earnings, is they are anchoring to what is near now. And they're not moving that far away because that anchor is keeping them there the same way it kept you where you were. When the market's going up, we're anchored to a rising market. This is what our mind has created. This is also mixed with something called recency bias. It's what's been happening, and we're anchored to that. And we don't stop and think, what could possibly turn this thing the other way? Or vice versa. We're anchored to a falling market, and we don't stop to unanchor ourselves and say, what can turn this market up? And that's true with inflation, and it's true with anything that is going on and kings is anchored to a certain trend. So many people believe that interest rates are going back down to where they were. Wall Street people, Main Street people, who have this vision of a 30-year mortgage at 3.2, 3.4. That's already high. It was 2.8, 2.7, 10-year treasury at less than 1%. They're anchored to that. It may happen. It may not. But if it does, it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that it was once there. I've met people who grew up in a generation where mortgages were 15, 16, 17%. And when they saw an 8% mortgage, they couldn't believe it. They said, who gives away money at 8%? And then when it came down to 3 or 4, they said the world's gone mad. Because they were anchored to what they had grown up with. And if you're making decisions based on an anchor of where a stock was, right? It's a bargain because it was 54 and now it's 27, and you're anchoring at the 52-week high, or vice versa. You're anchoring to the 52-week low, and you're thinking the stock is overpriced because it's doubled since then. That's a terrible way to make a decision. We have to adjust to new realities. We have to almost clear the board of what's been because history only teaches us so much. And where an investment has been does not tell you what its value is. And we shouldn't use that anchor the way you use the anchors that I put into this questionnaire or it's going to lead to investment mistakes. So let's recap. Representation bias or representative bias means you make a decision based on faulty or incomplete facts. You see what's before you and you don't look deeper. Mental accounting means you treat different buckets of money differently. Regret aversion is why we stay out of good investments and stay in bad ones. And anchoring is why we are slow to adapt to new realities and we stay rooted in the past. The solutions are, you must seek out base rate facts, like how many librarians are there in the United States before you become biased by what you see before you. Don't let your mind play tricks on you like that first visual of the three guys in the tunnel. Look at your money and spending in totality. $25 is $25. It doesn't matter when it's compared to the cost of something large or small. It's the same $25, and it has the same purchasing power no matter what the scenario. Regret never hurts as much as we think it will. And as I told a client, there's never been a death certificate issued where cause of death was regret. We will get over it. Try to use mind over... Body, mind over emotion. If something is in a good investment, sell it. 
You'll forget about it in three or four days. Sell a bad investment when you logically know that it's a bad investment or speak it over with somebody who can help you make that decision. Try to make financial decisions based on fact and not feeling. Yesterday is gone. The 52-week low or the 52-week high don't matter. What matters is what is the prospects of this investment right now and is it a good investment? What is inflation now? What is it based on? What are interest rates based on? What is the market valuation today? Don't anchor yourself to something that has absolutely no relevance. I hope this was helpful. Thank you all for hearing me out. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Kosher Money. We are rolling. We got episode after episode after episode. We can't thank you enough. My brother does something cool. He has a word of the week where when he airs an episode, he tells the viewers to put a single word in the comment section. Obviously, if you want to comment, comment away. But I want you to comment the word impactful. If you see this, I want to try to outdo him. If you're watching this, just comment, like the video, and click into the comment section, write impactful. If you are listening on a podcast, there is no comment section. I don't know why they don't have that. Um, but head over to YouTube and search up this video and type the word impactful because the more comments, the more views it gets, the more people we can help. And Naftali Horowitz is a legend. His videos literally have millions of views. We didn't even put an intro on this video because he doesn't need an intro. Um, awesome event in Lakewood. Thank you to our sponsors. We have approved funding. Look Shmuel up. His link is contacts in the show notes. Highly recommended. Kol Chabad org slash kosher money give a much needed donation and thank you to our friends at twillery i'm wearing one of their shirts right now more and more people if you are in need of amazing shirts pants suits socks they've got more on their website twillery.com slash kosher money use promo code chai so they know that we sent you thank you to our friends at living smarter jewish.org if you need financial advice right you're just not sure who to speak to or whatnot they have a ton of free resor free resources Thank you to Zevi, Simon, and everybody there at the OU's livingsmarterjewish.org. If it's your first time here, we have bonus content on mishpacha.com, our publication partner. We have bonus content there. Every couple of weeks, they release a new um, bonus episode on mishpacha.com and then more content in their magazine. So subscribe. You can get it delivered to your door. Thank you to you right? Because without you, we wouldn't be here. So many people have reached out. We love feedback. So visit livinglechaim.com slash kosher money. That's, I don't even know if that's a URL. Just go to livinglechaim.com, click on the suggest tab and tell us who you'd like to see next. Tell us what you love about kosher money. Tell us what you don't love about kosher money. I'm actually going to be in Israel, um, as I said, and I'm going to be recording a couple of awesome episodes there that can only be recorded in Israel. So I'm excited about that. And this outro doesn't have to be any longer, so I'm going to stop talking. Thank you again. Really appreciate all of you. And we're just getting started. Have a good one. Living L'chaim.